Valley's Gold is produced through a partnership between the Fresno County Farm Bureau and Valley PBS. Production of this program is made possible in part by a grant from E and J Gallo Winery. Agriculture, it's the economic engine that drives this region. On this episode of Valley's Gold, we're peeling open the California citrus industry, the fruits that bring us the sweet taste of sunshine. So join me, Ryan Jacobson, as we squeeze some fun into our show. We're beginning our day in Delano, and with me I have Kurt Holmes of Holmes Ag. Kurt, thanks for joining me. Pleasure to be here. Well, we're talking California citrus today, but you guys are diversified growers. Tell me about your operation. Well, we farm uh, citrus, we farm grapes, and we farm figs as well. Uh, my brother has some figs, and he, he's responsible for those in the Fresno uh, Chow Chill area. I take care of the citrus operation. That's kind of Fresno South. We go as far south as uh, uh, McFarland. Great. So. Now, you're a second-generation farmer. You're father actually started the, the business. Yeah, he started in the late 40s uh, after World War II. Met my mom and uh, actually started uh, with a little grocery store uh, in Fresno, downtown Fresno, right behind the community hospital. And from there they got a little 40 acre uh, raisin vineyard and one 40 acres led to another 40 acres and, and kind of grew from there. Well, that's great. Now we're talking California citrus, and which is obviously a very broad encompassing uh, description when you talk about the variety of different crops that we have here. Behind us, we have some navels. Let's talk about the growing process for the navels here in California. Uh, navels are kind of interesting, and uh, you can grow a navel orange in many places of the world. But the good thing about the valley is it's as far enough away from the equator that it's cold, and you get this nice bright orange color. And uh, but it's not too far away where it's too warm, because in those areas where it's really warm, you get a blotchy green type of looking thing. It tastes great, but it's as far from an orange. Got it. Now, uh, when does the actual process begin? When does the, uh, we know there are evergreen trees, but when does the actual bloom set all the way through the harvest season? Yeah, we're, we're talking uh, uh, late March, April, you know, starting to bloom, and we're starting with our bloom sprays, and, uh, and then we have a little piece of fruit. We'll start with uh, some of our pesticides to keep uh, thrips off and other, other, other issues, and our nutrient sprays are, are, are there then as well. And, uh, uh, you know, right now we're in uh, November and the fruit, uh, the first fruit, this is our first harvest right now, and uh, it's ready to come off. And the harvest, is this actually, how do you actually take that piece of fruit off of the tree? Well, it's all done in, with, with uh, it's all fresh pack, and so it's all done by hand. Uh, we're blessed to have a lot of labor in the valley, uh, some good people that, that are here, and then they pick my hand, we go in the bins, and from the bins they go to the packing house, and, and from the packing house they're... Uh, there's different uh, requirements that are met there for them to get in the carton. Now, when we talk uh, navels, that's one type of the varieties, and, and you said we'll pretty much pick those November through as late as April, May? June. As late as June, yeah, okay. We'll pick, we'll pick navels on this ranch starting in November, sometimes October, but no, no November, and we'll go all the way to June. And then we talk about diversification. You pick pretty much year-round because then we move over to the Valencias. Valencias start for us in around late, uh, well, April, let's say, and uh, we'll go all the way to October. And one thing fun about the Valencias is you have two crops hanging at the same exact time. Sometimes you do. If it's, if it's uh, past bloom, sometimes we'll have, uh, or most times we'll have, a, a small little Valencia like this and a big Valencia like that. Later on in the season, like in October, we may have a big green Valencia and a big orange Valencia. And we have to just swing between the two to pick, obviously. And Kurt, you can't talk citrus without talking that very important weather period during December and January. We all know that you talked about the warm temperatures during the summer and that just cold enough during the wintertime, but sometimes it gets too cold. What's the magic degrees for keeping these things healthy? You know, that's, that's kind of a, 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 a variable thing. Um, typically, we don't want to see in the temperatures uh, in the 25s, 26s for long durations. In other words, if it just hits 25 and spikes and it goes back up, that's really not a concern for us whenever the citrus has good sugar. Uh, early on, though, we'll start wind machines around 30 degrees, 29 degrees to make sure w those durations of that cold temperature aren't too long. As the, as the fruit matures and gets more sugar, then we can start maybe a little bit later on in the morning uh, or uh, when it's colder, about 28, 29 degrees, 27 degrees sometimes. And, uh, but if we start getting that 25, 26 degrees for more than four or five hours, we're going to have some significant damage out there. And the wind machines, what exactly are those doing to help protect this crop? 
Most nights in the valley, you know, cold nights, we have an inversion layer and where the, the radiant heat from the ground rises and it settles around 35 feet or something like that. And those machine towers that we see around are, uh, the, the head's around 35 feet and they'll take and they'll basically suck that warm air and mix it with the cold air down below. And on a good inversion layer night, it could be, the, that air temperature could be six, seven, eight degrees warmer up, up high wow. at 35 feet. And that'll, immediately we start those machines that air, air down below will warm up. Well, Kurt, thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to going on and learning a whole lot more about the California citrus industry. It was my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. California agriculture would not exist without those that protect the industry. I'm out near Dinuba today at Green Leaf Farms with partner Nick Hill. Nick, thanks for having me out. Well, thank you for coming. Well, first off, let's begin. You're a first generation farmer. Yes, I am. And you know, we're in you're the middle of your citrus orchards. Tell us a little bit about what type of uh, varieties you have here. Well, Green Leaf Farms is a multi variety company. We farm lemons, mineolas. These are some grapefruit here. I've got mandarins and some pink and uh, red uh, navels. Uh, also farm some walnuts and, and almonds. Okay, great. Well, let's begin with these uh, gorgeous grapefruits in back of us. What do we have? These are star ruby grapefruits. They are especially grow well here in the valley. They like the heat. They're high producers. Um, we like the, uh, the, like the, the time they come off in the year in the summer. So we're picking fruit from, from September, all my other varieties, all the way through into the summer. Uh, they're a nice sweet grapefruit and they got a good market so we're real happy with them. Well great and like I said a uh, sweet grapefruit is something you don't typically hear so it's something <laughs> I'm gonna have to try out there. Exactly. <laughs> well the, the biggest reason we're here today is to talk about invasive species and you have a big important role in that. Yeah I'm the chairman of the California Citrus Pest and, and Prevention uh, Committee. It's a, uh, it's a state uh, committee. Uh, we are self-funded by the growers. Every grower who packs a 40-pound box through a packing house gets assessed nine cents. That brings about $15 million of grower money to help assess or, or to help with this, um, this project. What we're trying to do is keep invasive species, which are bugs or diseases that are spe particularly specific to citrus, keep them out of the state. Right now, we're fighting Hong Long Bing, which is in Florida, Texas, and in Mexico. It is a devastating disease to citrus industry. It's a, it's a bacterial disease that attacks the tree and kills it. So the only thing that carries the disease is a small bug called the Asian citrus psyllid. And we're trying to track that bug. It's in the Cal California. We have traps set out through every commercial orchard and in all the urban areas. We've been uh, funding those programs along with informational programs to growers and to the urban telling people what we're trying to do. We're trying to let everybody know what they can and what they should do in case they find the disease. If you go out to your backyard citrus tree and you see some little bugs, you see these, all these little bugs flying around, you might want to call your local ag commissioner. They'll come down and take a look and see what you got going. Also, we're asking people not to move fruit, trees, or budwood in and out of areas. That's what carries the disease and also carries the bug around. So if the, the public will just take those few things into consideration, and we're out tracking the bug and trying to keep it down and eradicate the, this, we, could, we hope we'll stay ahead of this disease. And ACP obviously is in the news a whole lot right yes. now. Talk about the devastating effects it's had specifically in Florida. Well, in Florida, uh, they discovered the, the disease HLB in 2005, and since then over half the acreage has gone out of production, and it looks very, very bad in Florida. Uh, Texas has discovered it, uh, and they're trying to eradicate what they can. It's in Mexico, it's in South America, it started out in Asia, so China and South Africa have it too. We're one of the few places in the world that are pristine as far as it goes for HLB, and we want to keep it that way. This is our industry. We want, to sell, we want to save grandma's tree in the backyard, and we want to save our industry. So we need everybody to work together. And that's incredibly important because uh, we get a lot of calls from folks that are asking questions about why is this trap in my backyard tree and what's the significance of it. And they got to understand we're talking a billion dollar industry here Correct. in California. Exactly. So the California citrus industry absolutely depends upon what this, what your committee's work is doing to protect it. It depends on my committee and it depends on the public awareness. Well, good. Well, Nick, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to uh, share some information about invasive species with me. Well, thank you very much for coming in and talking with me. Appreciate it. Thanks.
We've headed over to Porterville Citrus in Terrabella. With me, I have Jim Phillips and Ryan Davis. Thanks for joining me, guys. Thank you, Ryan. Well, Jim, I was amazed when I walked through the operation. State of the art. Let's begin with what happens when the citrus first arrives here. When the citrus first arrives, it's received into our receiving rooms, which can either heat or cool fruit. This time of the year, the fruits were, were harvesting navels, which start in October and we're having to gas that fruit to bring the, the orange color out in it. It has good internal maturity, but it's still a little bit green this time of the year. So the fruit comes in, it goes through the degreening process, and then it starts the, the process side of washing and disinfecting and applying the, the wax and, and the packing process at that point. Well, I, and first off, one thing that I love seeing was the way that you actually unload those bins through a submergent process. Talk about why you do it that way. Yeah, we, we've had a, we, we re, designed our process line about four years ago now and we go through a submergent process similar to apples and so the bins are submerged in water and allows the fruit to float out which is very easy on the product it also allows us to put sodium bicarbonate which is a disinfectant that starts that sanitation process uh, with the fruit and so it's a, a very efficient and easy way to handle the product and then one of the highlights I love was going in the UV room where you actually have the UV lights and you're able to pick up any damage on that fruit. Yeah, once the fruit comes through the uh, the wet process and, and comes through probably the, there's four grading processes that we go through in the entire process. But the first one is what we call our dark rooms where we have ultraviolet light. And what ultraviolet light does is any injuries that may become decay or, or some kind of a, a defect it that's the first opportunity for us to see that and it shows up under ultraviolet light where it might not be visible to the human eye and ryan the mechanization of this plant is amazing talk about that as well as the labor that's required to keep this plant going well we have a strong nightly routinely maintenance program along with uh, detailed summer maintenance five to six weeks out of the summer that we really tear into the plant when we go through it as far as the labor part of it very important key uh, we'll, today we'll probably have about 100, 110 on hand and through the peak season when we're double shifting it's closer to 250 people to keep this thing going. And Jim, as we continue to see that process as this went through, we went through the wax bath and it makes it into the inside of the plant. What happens from that stage? From that point, uh, it's been graded once. I mentioned that we grade yeah. the fruit four times. The next process or, or grading opportunity is done electronically uh, with optical equipment that does size, blemish, color and can even do shape if, if in fact we're asking it to do that and it's carving that fruit up into categories for us that then go back in front of people again uh, to be graded one more time it then follows the process all the way through the sizing uh, process which which segregates fruit into the sizes and applies a sticker to it and then just prior to going into the carton, we have a last check grade just to make sure that everything has found its way into the right category before it actually goes into the holding bins to be packed. And you guys pack a lot of different type of cartons here. Yes, we do. We pack standard 40 pound carton equivalents, which has been the, the standard for many, many years. But in recent history with, uh, with all the different retail requests, we've done a lot of consumer packaging. We package everything from a four pound bag to a 10 pound bag. We put fruit in 10 pound cartons, um, tri walls, which are, are cardboard bins with high graphics that are displayed at retail. And, and so, yeah, a lot of different package types, right? And I think I need to wrap up with by explaining to our viewers that they probably see our breath and knowing that we're in the cold storage facility part of this whole operation. Talk about what temperature are we at right now and how long would this fruit typically store in this type of environment? Well, we're trying to move this fruit through as quickly as possible. Fruit can be here anywhere from as, as short as eight hours all the way up to three or four days. We try to hold the fruit at 40 degrees, 41 degrees. Uh, most of the shipping requirements by major retailers are that the fruit pulps at somewhere between 40 and 45 degrees before it ships. Um, also, anything that's going into a container that might be destined for an export market, we like to make sure that that fruit's good and cold and cooled off so all the heat's out of it. It just prolongs the shelf life and the, and the, and the shipping capability. Well, great. Well, Jim and Ryan, thank you so much for showing me around the citrus operation. Really appreciate you guys taking time out of your schedules to let me learn a little bit more about the citrus packing industry. Uh, it's our pleasure. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thank you. Over the past
past 150 years, citrus has blossomed into one of the valley's top crops. To share this very important history, I have Elizabeth Lavelle. Elizabeth, thanks for joining me. Well, Ryan, you know, the cultivation of citrus orchards actually began during the 1860s when Mrs. William Hazelton and Harvey Akers planted seedlings in the Kings River bottom. And you can see this photo. It has so many things that are great to look at. I, I love the planting, the boxes and all that, but there's always dogs. Pop always knew how to frame those shots. But I, the, my favorite part of this whole photo is look at these wheels. Yeah. Those are wooden wheels. It had to be pretty hard to get in and out of there. This was taken about 1915. In the mid 1870s, pioneer F.T. Eisen began growing orange trees near Fresno. Person, you know, using his horses out there. Yep. By the early 1880s, children could go into their backyards and actually pick orange from small groves in the center of their towns. By 1905, Fresno County growers began participating in the industry's marketing organization, the California Fruit Growers Exchange, which is also known as Sunkiss. So oh, wow. as we saw today, yep. really started around 1905. And they were really to promote the Golden State's oranges, which we really know had to be seen across the world. In 1907, the Pacific Fruit Express was established, increasing the number of refrigerated rail cars to transport oranges all the way to the East Coast. We think about the fruit growing, but now they put them on trucks, they're refrigerated, it's easy to get them across country, even as we heard, across the world. Yep. But in the early 1900s, it was pretty novel to be able to ship them to the East. Most fruit was dried <laughs> before that. However, the freezing temperatures often damaged crops. The farmers were hit hard and they learned to plant the citrus as we've seen against the hills because it kept the temperature up a little bit. So they found out that that could help them quite a bit and make them a little bit better and warmer. This is one of my very photo favorite photos from our citrus collection. This was a panoramic of Lemon Co taken wow. around 1913, 1914 for the San Francisco Pan Pacific International Expo. But as you see, they always were by the foothills. That's kind of where the, the industry developed. So quality control is always very important. And here we have Sanger Gold being harvested and in, in, in boxed here in December of 1925. Really a nice picture from citrus across our whole valley. And I love the fact that you, on the end of the box, you still see that label. You know, yes. Labels during the valley during that time were so important to the they history. Every crop, you know, it had their special labels, whether it was the figs, and they had, they always put something personal in there. But gold is one of, as we know from Valley's Gold, gold is one of our favorite words to use too. Ryan, as you know, our hot, dry summers and relatively cool winters have helped create this citrus crop that really no one in the world can compete with. It's so tasty blend of sugar and acid, unlike seen anywhere else that you can find. And the one thing that's great right now is we're in the capital of the citrus. We're in Orange Cove. We are. And with us, we have Trish Johnson with the Orange Cove Women's Club. Trish, thanks for joining me. <laughs> nice to be here, Ryan. You have some uh, pretty special history to share with me about the Women's Club. We do. Um, we wouldn't be here if the founder, E.M. Sheraton, hadn't found an Orange Cove and the same year, Women's Club was founded as well. And we do have a picture of them. Uh, standing by his uh, little rattan chair there. <laughs> and um, uh, like was said, the uh, oranges were harvested by horse and buggy and uh, brought away, and this picture shows that as well. Yeah. Um, his building, where he had his offices, is still standing in Orange Cove. It's 100 years old. There's a hardware store there now. And um, most of the growers around here do still shop at that hardware store. The next photo that we have here shows how the oranges were transported by truck and they were packed right in, sometimes right in the orchards. Yeah. And uh, they would color up nicely because Orange Cove was basically a frost-free area when Mr. Sheraton found it and sold 6,000 acres here for 10, 20 acre plots and only sold for 100 to $200 an acre. Wow, that sounds pretty different. good today, yeah. A little different today. Um, the way, and Elizabeth had mentioned this, the way a lot of the oranges were transported was through rail, and the railroad did come here, and this picture shows the first train pulling in with railroad officials, and then uh, October, of uh, 1914 approximately, 1917, around that year, uh, we started transporting passengers here. Okay. So we did have that. Getting back to the women's club, I absolutely love this picture because it shows some of the women's club members during World War II that worked in the war effort to make bandages and learn nursing skills. 
and today um, as the years have progressed uh, the women's club gives scholarships for nurses to go to school and this picture shows a group of women in the 1940s and I love the dress uh, they came to club with hats and gloves and dresses and uh, certainly uh, the majority of them were farmers wives as is today so it's uh, lived on and we will be celebrating our centennial this year and we have plans to uh, collaborate with the Chamber of Commerce here. Well, Trish, congratulations on the Women's Club reaching their centennial mark. Not a whole lot of organizations do that. I appreciate all the history that both of you shared on this very important industry. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks. Here on Valley's Gold, we like to expose you, the viewer, to the many tastes and sights of the products we're featuring. I'm with Scott and Marie Munger of the Plantation Bed and Breakfast in Lemon Cove. Thanks for joining me, guys. Thank you. Thank we're you. glad you're here. Well, first off, you guys have an amazing house here that's a bed and breakfast. Tell me the history of how you got into this business. Well, about uh, 18 years ago, my wife, I had been married for two years and told me she always wanted to do a bed and breakfast. and. Uh, we both had real jobs and uh, I didn't know what a bed and breakfast was. She told me what it was and took me to one and I said, okay, I can do that. And we, uh, about a year later, quit our jobs, sold everything we had, hopped in our little car and toured the country for a year and a half until we found this place. And so you are not even originally from California then? No, we had to get out of the Connecticut where the ice and snow was trying to kill me. And you found one of the most beautiful pockets right here in Lemon Cove where you're able to see the beautiful mountains around you but not have to experience that snow that you were trying to get away from. Yes, indeed. <laughs> it's obviously an older house. I'm sure there's a history behind it. Uh, there is. Uh, three men settled this town in uh, 1879, came from the Bay Area, and one of them claimed 20 acres here and built that old rock house, got married, had kids, and he worked 20 acres of orange trees and then in 1908 sold the property and the big house was built and they turned the old uh, rock house into a garage and uh, so this house was built in 1908 there was a fire in 1968 and then uh, they rebuilt pretty much the same blueprint and the same foundation and still had sleeping porches from when it did before and uh, and this is what we have now well, fantastic. And as far as someone that comes here to stay, obviously you have a theme that goes on in the house. Would you like to tell me a little bit more about that? That is the Gone with the Wind theme, as you may have noticed. <laughs> uh, and uh, I always loved that book and movie, and, and I wanted a theme. And the history had some, it had some nice history, but it just didn't, the theme didn't gel. And so I thought, plantation, gone with the wind, and then the house started just speaking to me. I want to be Rhett Butler, I want to be Scarlett O'Hare in the rooms, you know. <laughs> and that's what I love is that you guys have even transformed this gorgeous backyard into matching the theme of the house there. So right. you really feel a part of it. And Scott, one of the fun things about the plantation is you've had visitors come from all over the world to visit you. Yes, we have. In 17 and a half years, we've had over 43,000 people stay here from 110 different countries. And some days, there's nobody here that speaks English, and there's a lot of gesticulating going on. And the one thing I love about this operation, I'm looking at the full staff right here. You guys are the two that keep this thing running, and you told me sometimes you went five to six months this year without break. Right. Yeah. That's without incredible. a day off, just people here every without day. Without a day off, and you guys have just been steady all that whole time. Yep. Well, perfect. Well, the reason we're here is to test Chef Marie's products. I, apparently, I've heard that she has or includes citrus in all of the meal items that take place here at the ranch, and we're headed indoors to go sample some of those. Okay. Okay, let's, let's do it. on in. Okay. Well, we've stepped inside the plantation with Chef Marie, and I'm getting to sample some of these wonderful treats we have in front of us. I'm going to start with this orange juice. Tell me the story behind it. Well, that is a navel orange you're drinking the juice from, and most people think that you can't uh, drink, you can't make juice out of the navel oranges because it goes bad. But around here, it gets drunk so quickly that it's never old. Well, it tastes so it's, wonderful. Well, thank you. Now you have a very cool statistic when it comes to how many oranges Scott and you have squeezed over the years. Oh yes, it's over 300,000 oranges. 300,000. That's absolutely incredible. That's a lot of trees worth of oranges there. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me jump over to this unbelievably gorgeous grapefruit. My gosh, it's just huge. 
tell me a little bit about that. Uh, that is the Oro Blanca grapefruit right around the corner from our neighbor. And I uh, put um, marigolds from the garden. You could eat those if you want. Really? <laughs> yes. Wow, okay. And the fun thing is, is that you guys have actually sliced this all out so you make it too easy for me to eat here. Right. So it just slides right out like this. this and Okay, I'm amazed. I've never had that sweet of a grapefruit before. Oh, good. That's that, what most people think. Most people think they don't like grapefruit. But. I didn't think I liked grapefruit either until this time. I'm used to the real sour ones, but this is wonderful. Tree ripened. <laughs> awesome. And then we're going to finish off with uh, some scones that we have here. Talk a little bit about what, what went into this. Uh, these are uh, orange scones and also some, uh, I put cranberries on one, but... Um, the orange scones are made of um, like scone batter that I make up myself when it has uh, orange uh, zest and orange juice and then a little mandarin to decorate the top. And then around the holidays, I like to put um, the cranberries on there. So well, I already can tell they're nice and soft and gooey. They feel like they're going to be wonderful. So I'll go ahead and take a bite here. I got that hint of citrus flavor inside of it. All right. That is wonderful. And is this, of course, going to be found in your cookbook? Absolutely. <laughs> How can folks get a hold of you guys here at The Plantation? Uh, it's on our website at theplantation.net. Well, fantastic. Well, Marie, I thank Scott and you so much for having me out here today. This has been absolutely wonderful. Love tasting the treats. Love checking out the house. I can't wait to come back and stay here myself. All right. <laughs> we'll look forward to it. Thanks so much. And there you have it. Everything you need to know about the California citrus industry. Aren't you glad you joined me? Tune in again for more Valley's Gold. Valley's Gold is produced through a partnership between the Fresno County Farm Bureau and Valley PBS. Production of this program is made possible in part by a grant from E&J Gallo Winery.